right, everyone, if everyone could take their seats, I'm going to introduce the third panel. So this is our third and final panel um, of the conference today, and I hope you all, though, will stick around for the keynote conversation afterwards. Um, but this panel is called Courts and Legislatures as Agents of Change, and moderating our panel is Rachel Barco, who is the Siegel Family Professor of Regulatory Law and Policy, Vice Dean at the Law School, and the Faculty Director of the Center. Uh, she was previously a member of the United States Sentencing Commission, and she has a recently released book, Prisoner of Politics, which offers great concrete policy reforms um, for how we can improve the administration of criminal justice. And to her left is John Schoffel. John is an attorney in the Special Litigation and Training Units at the Legal Aid Society in New York City, and I just learned an NYU law grad, so we're excited he's back. Um, and he's been a leading figure in efforts to reform New York's restrictive criminal discovery rules for the past decade. Um, and he was a principal author of the New York State Bar Association Task Force on Criminal Discovery's report and proposal. And he'll have a lot to say today, I think, about um, the recent uh, reforms that um, Governor Cuomo has signed. And to his left is Robert Pittman. He's the United States District Judge for the Western District of Texas. And prior to his appointment, Judge Pittman served as the United States Attorney for the Western District of Texas and was also a United States Magistrate Judge. He has also co-authored two books on the criminal justice system, including Confronting Underground Justice, which focuses on improving the plea bargaining process. Um, and then to his left is Dwayne Betts. Dwayne is a PhD in law candidate at Yale Law School, uh, where he also received his JD. He was previously a Lyman Fellow who worked in the New Haven Public Defender's Office, um, and prior to law school was a Radcliffe, Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard's Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Studies, as well as a Soros Justice Fellow. And last but not least is Carissa Hessek. She's the Anne Shea Ransdell and William Garland Buck Ransdell Jr., Distinguished Professor of Law at UNC Law School, as well as the Associate Dean of Faculty Development. And she's, she writes on criminal sentencing and criminal law, and she's actually currently writing a book about prosecutors. So. Excellent. Thank you, Courtney. So I know these post-lunch panels are tough, but <laughs> if you are disturbed by everything in the first two panels, we're supposed to solve it and figure out what should be done um, outside the prosecutor's office. So our charge is to figure out what it is that judges and legislators could be doing to address this problem. Um, so I thought I would start us off by asking, you know, kind of in our dream environment, the legislative reforms that you all might like to see. Um, and just to kind of highlight some things from uh, earlier panels and discussions we had. Um, so, you know, it, the way I would group it is there are problems with plea bargaining. On the one hand is just the coercive one-sided nature of it. And so reforms that could be done to try to level the playing field. And so I imagine, you know, uh, people have already said getting rid of mandatory minimums, thinking about that gap between what's offered if you take a plea versus what's threatened if you go to trial. Um, um, maybe that's bail reform so that you're not detained while you're thinking about whether or not to take your plea or not. You know, things that would get rid of uh, that. And then um, the other bucket of problems that people had mentioned were the informational disadvantage that we see, um, where prosecutors just know so much more about the case, what it'll look like later than defendants might know what that case looks like from the prosecutor side, um, which may suggest a different set of reforms uh, like the ones we saw in New York. And so I guess um, what I thought might be fun uh, is if you could just recommend recommend one legislative fix, what you think, and I know the answer you're all going to want to say is we need all of them, and I think we do, but if we were trying to prioritize where to really put reform efforts and energy, I would love to hear from each of you about what you think it would be the most fruitful way to address these issues. So we'll start at the end with Carissa and kind of work our way back down. <laughs> Well, since you already said mandatory minimums, I want to do a, a, a slight spin on sort of the substance of the substance of criminal law answer, because I, I think it's important to recognize that nowadays when legislatures are writing laws, they know that plea bargaining will happen. And so they write laws that facilitate plea bargaining, right, that make it easier. And not just by providing for mandatory minimums that provide leverage, but also providing for crimes that are written more broadly than what they'd actually like to see criminalized. So they won't include the appropriate mens rea standard, for example, or the, the quantity of drugs will be set a lot lower than what they think would be appropriate for those penalties. And it's done 
quite explicitly sometimes, you know, in the legislative history, to give prosecutors more flexibility at plea bargaining. And I have to say, I don't think that that's the legislature's job. I think it's the legislature's job to try to figure out what should be legal, what should be illegal, and what are the appropriate penalties if you prove that, that particular behavior, and then plea bargaining should be very separate. Excellent, Dwayne. I think um, this was a tough question, but. Well, I had to get you guys going um, after lunch, you know. Like, but no, I, I think so, I think one of the real challenges is that say you commit three different crimes. Say you commit three robberies. And even if the judge decides to give you seven years for each robbery and you think that seven years is, is okay for a robbery, you still end up having 21 years. So I would suggest that the, that your, the sentence that you serve is connected to the highest sentence you get for whatever spate of crimes you get charged with. And that way, it, 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 it would just dramatically reduce the possibility of a prosecutor or a judge actually getting a 30 or 40 year sentence and then being able to rationalize it by saying, well, you've really only got six years for that robbery and seven years for that robbery and three years for that gun. So I'm sitting here trying to think of, <clears throat> of how lawyers answer questions in my court when I say one thing and they say three things in one. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a way to do that, but I will, if, if I'm restricted to one, I'll say this, uh, and it's been referred to in, in a variety of, of ways in the past two panels, and that is um, the legislative fix, I think, that would be of greatest import in this area would be um, the, uh, the diversion of significant resources uh, from incarceration to alternatives to incarceration, because we can talk all day about the mechanics of plea bargaining and the history of plea bargaining and everything else, but I'll tell you one of the things that we came up with in our research for the latest book, uh, Professor Bill Kelly and I at the University of Texas, uh, we did some qualitative uh, research um, uh, that we, we did a lot of uh, interview research of prosecutors, lawyers, uh, pro prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, and the thing that prosecutors kept coming back with is that we got one tool in our toolkit. Um, we, got, we send people to jail uh, or federal prison and they don't have, their imagination extends to what's in front of them and what, what the resources are. Um, and as long as they're restricted to one option, and that is don't prosecute or send somebody to prison, and especially in federal court, the people you're dealing with, probably gonna, there, there needs to be some consequence, um, then how can we expect uh, that we're gonna do anything differently than we're doing? So I think th to give prosecutors uh, other resources, other options, um, and that's gonna take uh, vast resources and inevitably a diversion of resources uh, from law enforcement and incarceration. And I think until that happens, uh, we're gonna be spinning our wheels. John? Well, as the New York State practitioner on the panel, um, I can say we have just taken some major strides that a lot of us have been trying to accomplish for 40 years. I've worked on discovery for 10 years, so we're gonna be talking more about that, but um, We've just made some enormous reforms on bail, speedy trial, and discovery. I think the other thing that has to be looked at is just the sentence ranges are so colossal and enormous in New York State. And this began largely in the 1990s, in the Governor Pataki was the Republican New York governor, in the Giuliani era. I mean, a, a typical sentence range for a, a B felony in New York, someone has a you know, prior record, five to 25 years, five to 25 years, and those were enacted precisely, I think, to coerce pleas and give prosecutors the means to coerce pleas. And I just think the sentence ranges are far too high and we need to look more realistically at that. Okay, excellent. Since, um, John, you mentioned the recent discovery um, and bail reforms and speedy trial reforms here in New York, maybe you could tell us, um, you know, briefly, uh, we don't have to get all the details about it, but what you think are the kind of key aspects of them and how you think they're gonna help with plea bargaining in particular? Well, because it's a system of pleas, um, any change like this is gonna have dramatic effects on pleas. I mean, I think I, I, I have to start by explaining to people how bad and outmoded New York system is today, including where we're all sitting right now. Um, it's been said earlier that New York was one of the four states with the most restrictive discovery laws in the country, alongside Louisiana, South Carolina, and Wyoming. And the main problem has always been the most important evidence that the defense and defendant needs in order to both investigate cases and make informed decisions in the case is witness statements, police reports, 
and who are the witnesses? And the problem with New York's law today is prosecutors can withhold those things until the day of trial. The day of trial. You'll get some video recordings at some point, um, you know, some scientific testing reports at some point before trial. Really, there's not even a deadline there that gives prosecutors a big motivation to go gather those things from the police. But a lot of prosecutors just will dump a ton of evidence on you on a year into your case. And if you want to learn who's accusing you, you can decide to turn down all the offers and go to trial. So right here, Manhattan, District Attorney Cyrus Vance has always had this policy that if you're accused of a felony, he will not tell you who the accuser is. You are accused by a person known to the grand jury or a person known to the district attorney's office. And so nothing makes sense. And you know, talking to a client, counseling a client today about a plea offer, um, what's the evidence? They're offering you 15. I mean, let's say they're offering you five. You could get 15. What do you want to do? It's like, what's the evidence? Sorry, I can't tell you. Sometimes their case turns out to be weaker than we thought. Sometimes it turns out to be stronger. I can't get it. And it just destroys attorney-client relationships because the client has, has no faith in the lawyer. And it's especially problematic because today, the Brooklyn DA, Eric Gonzalez, provides open discovery in most cases. So you could be on Rikers Island and your cellmate has all the police reports, all the important information, and you're Manhattan, you're, you're being prosecuted in Manhattan. You can't even find out the accuser unless you choose to show up in court. You know, they'll, they'll give you a few police reports, but you have no right to, in recent years, you have no right to anything until the day of trial. So that's where we are today. And that had to be reformed because no one could, you know, plea bargaining became just a mathematical calculation of risk. Really, that's all it came down to um, in, in many, many cases where there was just no way to investigate, no way to know what the evidence against you. Just look at the sentence range. Here's the offer. What do you want to do? So what happened um, after 40 years Nothing, there were bills every year. Why didn't anything pass? Why in New York, supposedly a blue progressive state, did it take us 40 years? It took me 10 years. I started working on this in December 2008 when the Legal Aid Society wrote a report. Well, everyone knows the answer. It's that the Republicans had the state Senate for those 40 years, and they always listened to the District Attorneys Association. And we have a District Attorneys Association in this state to this day that is angry about these reforms, furious about these reforms. You can read their op-eds, you know, seven district attorneys from New York City and the surrounding counties just wrote an op-ed saying this is crazy. Um, you can look to the New York State Bar Association report which was mentioned. Read the dissenting opinions of the, is a statewide task force. Read the dissenting opinion. It's very interesting if you're an academic or someone just interested in this. The dissenting opinion signed only by the three current ADAs. Everyone else who was a former ADA, including like people, 30-year DAs, Mark Dwyer and people like that, signed on to the majority report. It's a very moderate report. But the, the, the dissent by the DAs is furious. Witnesses will get killed. You can't do this. You can't do this. Um, and they just had tremendous sway with the legislature until this session when the Democrats took over the Senate. Um, why do they take that position? I mean, I think it's just a status quo bias. I mean, it's hard to... Uh, they, they, they mean it genuinely, they're not bad people necessarily, they're just like, they're, they're not willing to accept that the rest of the country does this. And when we've brought people like the prosecutors this morning on, on, the, on the other panels who said, we've always done it this way, it works, we protect witnesses, we want this, it's fair. We've had them in the room with the New York State District Attorneys. Like the predecessor DA of Boston came and talked and said, we want to provide discovery. We don't have an issue with witnesses. The defense usually agrees if there's a witness concern or with a judge. They John, don't accept it. can I interject it. just to ask, yeah. since, since it's changed, by the way, it's going to have a happy ending, this part of the story. <laughs> um, but the district attorney objections, how much of it do you think was about this concern with witness protection when you had prosecutors from other states who have this saying yep. everything's fine? And how much do you think it was actually about plea bargaining and the leverage that having this kind of discovery rule gives them without, well, you know, you get to hold your cards till the eve of trial probably does help you with negotiations. If you have right. a sense of what might have been. I mean, I have my sense from talking to a lot of them and working on it for 10 years is that the real issue was the latter. That they like the system, they, liked, they like having the leverage, they can give it when they want, to who they want, and it, it made it much easier, made their jobs much easier to get pleas, and um, it's just very hard to engage in a major change like this. I think Texas and North Carolina, the prosecutors also really, resisted the change when it was imposed there. They tried to repeal it. There was a lot of noncompliance, but they've come around and now there was a report by 
you know, a, lot, uh, a survey by one of the, one of the people um, on this panel, a professor, 90% of prosecutors in North Carolina support their open file. We had Texas prosecutors writing to Governor Cuomo, the, the chief of the spe special victims unit in Texas, wrote to Governor Cuomo saying, do this. It works for us, we can do it. Don't listen to your district attorneys. And, and I really should get to what the law looks like now rather than filibustering here. <laughs> okay, so it worked. After 40 years, it worked. Governor Cuomo supported it. We had great allies in the legislature. There are two main reasons it worked. We had a community movement based on affected people, unions, you know, Innocence Project, all the defender organizations. We had a huge movement that the le they just went to the legislature and said, we have to get this done. So like when the hotel trades union in New York State made this their top priority, I went to the person there and I said, the hotel trades unit discovery reform seems like such a wonky, strange issue. And he said, no, this is the, we, we interviewed our members, this was their number one issue. So first thing we had was a huge movement. Um, and, and you know, the second thing was, the prosecutors just marginalized themselves from this debate by taking extreme positions. Like if you look at the New York State Bar Association opinion where they dissented, and you read the fine point of what they were willing to accept, they said, we will only, we agree discovery has to be reformed. They always say we agree. But we will agree after plea bargaining has concluded, 10 days before trial. That's when, they, that's when the prosecutors on that commission said discovery could happen. And if you look at the other statewide task force that worked for a year, the Justice Task Force, they were more reasonable. They said 30 days before trial. So what we got was 15 days after first appearance, um, you have full open file discovery. It's one of the most comprehensive discovery statutes. It's one of the most comprehensive statutes you'll ever read. I mean, a lot of law professors here, go look at this thing. It's 25 pages. It's so detailed. Um, there are automatic extensions if the prosecutor can't get the information from the police. One of the biggest problems in discovery is how, how does the prosecutor get the information from the police to get it to the defendant? Because one of the big problems is prosecutors say, well, they didn't give it to me. You know, we all, we all know these. So we tried to do some things, and in, in, in the legislature did some things in drafting the statute, like mandatory turnover of police files to the prosecutor and other things. Um, but the big picture is it's going to happen much earlier, um, 15 or 45 days after the start of the case. And it has a pre-plea discovery provision. So if the prosecutor puts a deadline on accepting a plea to a crime, not a low-level violation. If they put a deadline, they have to give you full discovery seven days before. Seven days is a pragmatic sort of window to look at the discovery. What happens if they don't do it? The defense can make a motion to the court, and if the failure to provide discovery meaningfully affected the defendant's decision and the prosecutor won't revive the plea offer the defendant lost, the presumptive sanction is to preclude the evidence that wasn't turned over. So that's a pretty big incentive. So it's going to be a new world, and we also have bail reforms and other things, but that's my summary. Excellent. Thank you. And I don't know if anyone wants to comment on your predictions of how this will help with plea bargaining or not, and if not, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I guess maybe I'll shift a little bit. We can come back to other legislative ideas, but um, maybe we should talk some about the judiciary and things that it can do, particularly given that you said it took... 40 years to get this done in a blue state and it required the mobilization that you described makes me more pessimistic that we'll see tons of big legislative changes to address this. Um, not completely, but somewhat. So if we think about what judges could do on their own right now with the inherent judicial powers they have. Um, Dwayne, I want to start with you because you have experience working in the Connecticut system, um, which has been written about previously as being one where judges are more actively involved in the process. Um, and so it would just be helpful to get Get a sense of you know how are they involved and you know are they helping or harming because you I'm sure also heard from earlier panelists there was a sense that if we had greater judicial involvement in the plea bargaining process there's no guarantee that they'll be there to lower sentences if that's what our concern is if our yeah. concern is prosecutors are using co coercive powers to get sentences that are too lengthy if judges get more involved you know how do we know they won't bring things up um, because there was some comments from other panelists that in their experience that had happened right. so if you could just kind of shed light on what you know about the process in Connecticut, and if judges aren't doing that, you know, what's, what's me, why is it different there? I'm sitting here listening to the description of New York and I'm completely baffled that, that you could live in a country in which that was the process and in a country in which the process that happens in Connecticut was going on. Like, it just seems like living in two different countries, living in two completely different worlds. Um, and so first, I'm just, I'm just trying to rethink this and wonder if what I saw happen in Connecticut actually really did happen. 
because maybe it was all just a dream. But um, I, so, so the first point I'll say though is, is one of the challenges I think is the people who actually know what's going on are people who work in public defender's offices, people who work in prosecutor's offices, and it's just so hard to imagine them to be able to do the work to you know, produce scholarship about the practice when their job is to prevent people from being incarcerated. Because um, when I started talking to people about what was going on in Connecticut, um, they just thought that why is it happening in, in, in that way and does it actually happen in that way? So I'll just give you a, a quick overview of the process and then um, I'll talk about why I think it's a benefit and, and I'll just make a couple of concessions. But, um, but an overview of the process is they had this thing called pretrial in Connecticut and almost every case gets pretried. And when you go to pretrial, you go into the room with, and also, man, I'm wondering if I should even say this, if like is this is being recorded, and I got the fear that like some of this stuff probably shouldn't be happening, but it's been written about by people other than me, so I'll just describe it and I'll leave it at that. Um, so you go and so, so every day, every time that your, your, your client has trial, before you go into court, before your client appears before the judge, you go into pretrial conference with the judge, and with the prosecutor. So the prosecutor will have a slate of cases. They might have seven cases, they might have 10 cases. And so you're in the room with the prosecutor with all of their files, and then every defense attorney that has a case that day is in the same room. Sometimes the, the, the um, private defense counsel isn't in the room for the negotiations that take place. But I was never there on an occasion where the public defender would be asked to lead a room while the negotiations would take place. And the negotiations were really, first it was open file, so we would know everything that we would know everything that the prosecutor had, or we would be taking an occasion to find out when they would give us everything that they had, and then and then we would negotiate, and it'd be a a, a process that that didn't happen in one day. Frequently, on the first day, you had an offer, but it was no expectation that you would take the offer on the first day, because you always had to go and return that offer to the client, and then you would always come back with a counter offer or any kind of mitigate, mitigating evidence that suggested that something else should happen. Now, uh, a couple of points about coercion is, of course, the, the main fear is that if the judge says, well, I'll give you this offer five years, and you don't accept it, and then you get found guilty at trial, you get 10 years or 15 years. But actually in Connecticut, what happens is, it depends on what kind of case it is, because some cases originate in the a, in a court of the chief judge. But if, a case that, if it's a case that doesn't originate in the court of the chief judge, then you get your first bite at the apple with, with that judge and with the prosecutor. And then if there's no settlement that, um, if you don't come to a settlement before you get put on a trial list, you go to the chief judge, and basically the same thing happens again. Now the judges are sort of reluctant to go under what another judge did, but still what happens is you get to, to present your case and present the arguments and think about the evidence in the context of a trial with two different judges. And then um, if you end up going on a trial list, you go to another judge that's actually in another court. So it's even less likely that it'll be any um, coercion that happens because you didn't take the offer the first time. And I would say, yeah, like I worked on cases and you know, and, and I would have to tell people what they were facing, and they would tell me what they would want the outcome to be, or what is a, a meaningful outcome to them. And sometimes we argued, I, I'll just talk about one case, because I think this is an example of two things. First, I always thought about plea bargaining as only consistent in those cases where my clients, or myself, because we always say my client, like it can't be us that's like guilty. I, I said guilty one time, that shit hurt my heart. It was not a joke. That was a joke, really. Nobody laughed. It was a joke that didn't land at all. Um, <laughs> but no, so we always say my client as if we can't be the client, right? As if we can't be in a situation and say, like, I plead guilty. But I had one case in particular that I'll just talk about because I think it illustrates, first, it's, it's not empirical. This is just my own experience, and it's really hard to get empirical data on this because you can't fundamentally get in the room if you aren't representing somebody. And in places like Connecticut, even though they're really open like this, the prosecutors have been really reluctant to open up their files or talk about this process. And again, a lot of it isn't written down anyway. So you get the offer, but at least you know you got the offer because the judge is in the room when you get the offer. And that judge might go under the offer that the prosecutor makes, so that judge might reject the offer, but at least every party is aware of what's happening. And because there's other defense attorneys in the room, I kind of believe it has set some standard of what justice is at least supposed to look like in that courtroom, as opposed to having widely disparate um, um, outcomes based on who your attorney might be, based on what kind of evidence that you're able to bring that they believe because you said it and don't believe because somebody else said it. And it deals with all of the sort of um, information asymmetries that we discussed earlier. But I'll just use one case because we're in New York and I think it's descriptive of like what can happen. So I had a client 
Client got locked up when he was 16 in 1996, and I got locked up when I was 16 in 1996. So I was sort of particularly like feeling like this, this kid could have been me. And he got locked up in New York, so he got YO the first time. And he's living in Connecticut. He applies for a gun license because he was a security guard, and he wanted to be a security guard at a bank, so he applies for a gun license. Well, as soon as he applies, it triggers a background check, and they lock him up for possession of a, of a firearm as a convicted felon because, because I guess signing a piece of paper suggested that he would at some point possess this firearm for purposes of getting a gun license. Now, that would have been a different argument to have at trial, but we didn't even get to that point because he was saying, wait a minute, I don't have a felony. And so I went into the negotiations with the prosecutor saying that this is a mistake. My client doesn't have a felony. And then the prosecutor said, that's what they all say. And at the next meeting, and I was offended because I was they, you know. So at the next meeting, I, I had called his PO, I'm not his PO, I called his attorney here, and I called the, the probation office here, and they were saying first in 1996, we don't have that computer system anymore, but I could pull it up and I could tell you what it says. Like I can't print anything out off of it. And she was like, yes, he had YO, and so he doesn't have a felony. So come back the next time, and the prosecutor says, listen, they all say that, and we had this FBI report, and I think that the FBI is better at doing their job than the state of New York. No offense to the state of New York. And so my client swears that he did not have a felony. So finally, um, I actually called and talked to the lawyer who represented him. And the lawyer that represented him says, yes, we played him out. He got YO, it was a drug possession case, and we looked at his record, and he had other charges later, but they were all misdemeanors. They weren't felonies. So I'm, I'm just not understanding what is going on with the world, right? Because the prosecutor's saying one thing is true, and I've had three occasions to talk to him, right? And he's saying one thing is true, and I'm saying something else is true. And a judge is saying, to the judge's credit, well, you know, attorney Betts, I didn't even have a law license at that time, so it made me feel good that she kept calling me attorney Betts. <laughs> but she was saying, attorney Betts, you, you really just... I need something. So I finally said, you know what, I'm gonna pay for a background check. And I paid for a background check. And what happened was um, he had the same attorney that represented him in both cases. But he got the first YO case and then he violated like two or three weeks later. Same attorney, they reinstated, but they didn't reinstate YO. They reinstated the same penalty, but for a felony this time and they misspelled his name. So everywhere in the state of New York, it comes up that he doesn't have a criminal, a felony record because his name is misspelled and the feds were able to catch this. So, my, so now at this point, my client is sort of basically factually guilty. And the next time, and now I'm, I'm sort of pissed because I had all of this faith that he was innocent and I was ready to go to bat forever. Um, but the next time I go, we talk to the prosecutor and I say, look, I made a mistake. And I explain what happened and I explain to the judge what happened and the case ends up getting all processed. Now, I think that sort of this is a reflection of maybe the, the, the best possible outcome in a system like that. And I had several other outcomes that were similar, but I think that's the case because the, the prosecutor and the judge had multiple opportunities to think not just about the underlying facts of the case, but the person that was presented before them. And even in a situation where it turned out that, you know, I was wrong and my client was wrong, and he actually did have a felony record, the prosecutor was able to say, this is the rare, the rare, the rare um, incident like this that I think this case shouldn't be pursued, and it got no process. So, um, so that's that's Connecticut. I found out that I think it's really rare. One person wrote about it in the past, Milton Human, and when when this started in 1970s, they were sort of just doing, it, and it, it exists in a different way in every um, ge geographical. Um, district in Connecticut, geographical area. So it's not as if it's a policy that exists in the same way. Some judges just talk to the defense attorney and the prosecutor for that single client. In New Haven, it happens to be multiple attorneys in there, and I think that has a benefit that's important and significant that doesn't happen in other places. But I think that, I mean, for me, if you're going to have plea bargaining, this is, this is a, a system that affords all parties to feel like they're heard and, and they have mitigation take a real um, place in the plea bargain negotiations, and, and also the, it, it, it decreases the opportunities for prosecutors to um, coerce a guilty plea because I always know that I could go to another judge, or I always know that the judge is able to hear it if it's a disingenuous um, charge for a long sentence, and you could just 
you know, demand a trial at that point. So can I just a quick follow up on that? And then I want to hear from the others. But in terms of the judicial role in that, so I mean, what I heard was it's good because defense lawyers are around each other and that helps spread some of the information of going rates for things. And the multiple bites at the apple where you come in more than once allows you to do some investigation and have the prosecutor think about what the right thing is as well as the defense. <clears throat> but if we were just kind of single out what the judge is adding to that process and being in yeah, front so of the judge, is it just that they're kind of a neutral third party overseer no. that, that they do step in sometimes when the prosecutor's yeah, the, the, offer is harsh? The judge, so in this case, you know, it was a different kind of case because we really weren't talking about sentence and we were just right. talking about facts. But sometimes you are talking about the sentence and the judge is like, the prosecutor offers this as a deal, five years, suspended after, after, after two. And the judge says, I'll offer five years, suspended after six months. And then it is like just bargaining. Like, can I get a right to argue at sentencing for a lower sentence? And the judge could say, yeah, I'll give you six month floor with a right to argue. And the judge will say straight up, you know, I control the sentence to a degree, but I don't control the charges. And so the prosecutor doesn't lose all of that power. The prosecutor still controls the charges, but you know, the judge controls the sentence. And I, you know, I mean, like fundamentally, I just felt like I had a lot of cases that had they been in New York, just listening to what I've just heard, would have been disposed, including that case, would have been disposed of probably far more harshly. But I've had other cases that um, just just unbelievable, that kind of outcomes that we got. And, and I've also been in a room to, to, to recognize what I feel like is real injustice. When I would hear this outcome for this case, this outcome for this case, this outcome for this case, and then for my case, the, the, the plea offer would be something that was significantly worse. And, and I would know that it was politically motivated. Like I would know that it would be about the kind of category of case it was and not the actual conduct that happened. But if I wasn't in a room listening to those negotiations with the other attorneys, I would have kind of been blinded. I, I would have known from my, from my peers what they were offered, but I wouldn't have been able to hear the arguments that the judge accepted in those kind of cases. So I think the judge does, they, they just speak to what they believe on the sentence, but also they speak to what they believe on the conduct. And sometimes when they talk about what they feel about the conduct, that's just as significant as what they talk about um, for the sentence. Because then when you prep and you come back, you could, be, you could come back to address um, those concerns of the judge and of the prosecutor. And again, just assuming that worst case scenario, we have to accept a plea offer, how do I get you the best offer as possible? Okay, excellent, thank you. And I guess one thing, I'll just a footnote to that is it does seem like judicial discretion is important for that. So I guess that ties in with what people were saying about mandatory minimums and the like, having the judge with more flexibility probably gives them a bigger role. Um, all right, so Carissa, maybe you could give us some um, insight into what judges could do or what a different court system do based on what you've learned from the Utah experience um, and their justice courts. Um, you know, uh, my understanding, lowest level misdemeanors, so potentially a different pool of cases, but any larger lessons you draw from what's happening there and what what a different plea bargaining world could look like yeah so um so i think one of the great things about having a conference like this where you bring together people who who've practiced in different jurisdictions right in in connecticut um folks from the federal system folks from new york uh, folks from elsewhere um is you can see that not everything happens the same way in different places and so I was, I was really shocked when I got out of law school, right? We, we learn in law school that there, there are three different levels of courts, right? There's sort of the trial court, the intermediate appellate court, and then the Supreme Court. Um, and that's not true, right? I mean, there are those levels of courts, but there are lots of other courts too, right? There are administrative courts, there are traffic courts. And a number of state have, states have things um, called justice courts or justice of the peace courts. I think they have them here. Um, in New York as well, and the thought is that there are an awful lot of low-level cases um, that we need to process quickly, and so uh, we have these less formal courts, and we send a lot of cases there. And in Utah, they send their Class B and Class C misdemeanors to justice court, and then the Class A misdemeanors and the Class A felonies, they go to, uh, to district court, to the regular trial-level court. Now, um, when I went to justice court, I, I went to Salt Lake City, um, a while ago now um, to shadow some of the, the public defenders there um, and to interview them about the justice courts. And, um, and it was interesting because in Salt Lake City, the justice courts, they, they look like a regular court. It's a, it's a courtroom. The, the public defenders have a contract with the county and the city where they represent all the indigent defendants who come through there. Um, the judges who sit on that court are lawyers. Um, 
when you go out into the rural counties in Utah, it does not look the same way. It's far less formal. Um, cases are routinely dealt with without anyone who's indigent being provided counsel. Um, the judges are sometimes not lawyers. Um, but so because they have this informal court system, uh, the state has to, as a matter of due process, have something else that they can do um, to make sure that the people who go through that court system um, have sort of due process of law. And the way they've dealt with it in Utah is they've said, you can get a trial de novo in the trial court, in the district level court, but we're gonna process lots and lots of cases in the justice court first, in this informal court. But if you lose, it's not an appeal. You just get a brand new trial on the merits. There's no deference to uh, whatever happened in the justice court. They don't even have a transcript in the justice court. It just goes up and you get a new prosecutor and a new judge and they just deal with the case um, sort of on its merits. And I should add, by the way, they see a crazy number of, of cases in justice court. Justice court has almost twice as many cases in a year as does um, the regular district court. Okay. so. Because you get a trial de novo in the district court if you lose in justice court, um, that means that the plea bargaining dynamic is really different, right? Um, and I, I interviewed uh, these young lawyers, these young public defenders, uh, who as a matter of office policy um, in the Salt Lake Defender's Office, they cycle in and out of justice court and district court. So they'll practice in both courts. They'll cycle every few months. Um, and they perceived their role very differently in justice court. And they said, for example, it was no problem for them to demand discovery and wait for discovery, right? The prosecutor couldn't say, we haven't heard back from the complaining witness, but this, this offer is only open for a limited time. They'd say, okay, so then we'll go to trial, right? Or I'm not gonna tell my, I'm not gonna advise my client to make a decision in this case, and so we've heard from the complaining witness, right? A lot of these sort of lower level cases are somebody went to the police saying that their neighbor or their friend or whomever had done something wrong, and so hearing from the complaining witness was really, really important. Um, they could file motions in district court without worrying about the prosecutor saying, well, if you file this motion, the deal is off the table. And in fact, if the, um, if the justice court judge decided the motion in the way they thought it wasn't appropriate, um, they'd say, that's fine. Well, we'll go ahead. You're not gonna suppress this evidence, that's fine. We'll try the case, um, and then we'll go up and we'll take another trial in district court and get a second bite at the apple with the suppression motion. Um, and the, the young lawyers, they said basically, they, their mantra was, why plead a case that you could try? And they would routinely advise their clients that they should only take a plea bargain if they genuinely wanted a plea bargain. And then they said sometimes they had clients who should really be taking a plea bargain, but the client didn't want to. And they'd use the fact that they could get a trial de novo in, in this relationship with the client. They'd say, look, um, we can take that approach in this case if you want to. That's not what I would advise you to do. But if we try it your way and it doesn't work, um, when we go to district court, how about we try it my way? And the client would say, that sounds like a great idea. So I have, I have these meetings with these folks. I shadow them through justice court. I'm thinking to myself, I've found sort of the ideal court. It sounds like exactly what it's supposed to be. Like most cases are going to trial. It's only if, if plea bargaining, like guilty plea genuinely seems like the best option that folks are gonna take it. So I asked to see some statistics from the court. Um, and I was shocked because the justice court statistics, right, the, the cases where they'll, you know, why plead a case that you could try, the trial rate was two and a half percent. It was really low. So then I asked to see the statistics from district court, and the trial rate for class A misdemeanors was less than one percent, and the trial rate for felonies was one percent. So they did have a much higher trial rate, it's just that the trial rate was still really low. But I'll tell you something else that I found really interesting the dismissal rate was super different. Now, I don't want to overstate this because um, the dismissal rate packed in a lot of different things, including somebody had unrelated felony charges pending, and as part of a negotiated disposition for those cases, they deal with these other charges in, ju in justice court that had, that had come out up when they were out on bail or something. But the dismissal rate for felony cases in district court was 25%. 
For Class A felonies in district court was 35%, and in justice court it was 45%. And these are just the statistics from the public defender's offices. So these are literally the same lawyers. They're dealing with the same prosecutor's offices. And they aren't dealing with the same judges, because the judges in district court are different than the judges in justice court. But it suggested to me that this difference, right, taking away the pressure of plea bargaining did result in more trials, but it also resulted in a number of prosecutors deciding not to pursue charges in that case, right? That, that in some ways the traditional sort of model that we see in regular trial courts, the pressure is really on the defense to try to, to, try to settle the case. But if the, if the prosecutors know, and they did know because these young district, you know, these young public defenders like to tell them, I'm just gonna tell my client we should take this to trial. A lot of times the response to that was to dismiss the charges rather than the prosecutor proceeding to trial as well. So I'll just say really quickly, my sort of takeaway from this was I was surprised that the trial rate wasn't higher and that suggests to me that there's something going on here when it comes to plea bargaining that's more than just sort of the legal regime that we have, it's also maybe sort of a, an attitude or a cultural regime as well that, that cases just really aren't gonna go to trial. Most of them aren't gonna go to trial. Carissa, can I just ask you two questions? To, um, in terms of the ability to threaten to go to trial, I'm assuming these people, so they're not detained while they're making, so I, I guess there's two things I just wanna ask you about. One is, is this a group of people who are not detained, and so the decision whether to go to trial and the delay associated with it is not pressuring their decision, and if, if that's not true, I would love to know why they feel different than people who are detained in other systems. And then the other is, um, is it that the differential sentence that they would face should they go to trial in district court isn't that much bigger? Because I'm just thinking of the pressure points elsewhere and how much that's mattering in this court that you're studying. So the detention issue pre-trial and then also just what is it that they're risking if they don't take the plea? Is it just the sentence isn't gonna go up much so they really are freely and voluntarily making a choice? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So the vast majority of the defendants were not detained, right? There were some exceptions, folks sometimes were being detained on felony charges, and then they had justice court charges as well, but the vast majority of people weren't being detained. We, d we did see them running into sort of the, the processes, the punishment type problems though, where they had folks who had to keep reappearing while the case was being continued again and again and again. Um, but the pre-trial detention was very different. Utah also is not, um, None of these people were facing mandatory minimums, right? These are relatively low-level misdemeanors. And the, the sentencing system there isn't particularly structured, so judges have a lot of discretion when it comes to sentencing. And I'll add that sort of ironically, um, the public defenders told me that sometimes um, their clients would fare much better in district court when it came to sentencing because the judges in justice court only saw B and C level misdemeanors, which you could have some of those cases that seem pretty serious and so they might get sort of the, the maximum sentence that they were permitted to get, but then they'd get tried again in district court, and the district court judges are seeing felonies, and so for them, even a serious, a serious looking or an aggravated looking B misdemeanor just didn't seem that, that big of a deal, and so they weren't inclined to give sort of towards the high end of the statutory range. Excellent, thank you. Um, so Judge Pittman, now we're gonna get to the judicial perspective on all this, um, and I guess there's kind of two things I'd like to hear your comments on. Um, so one is in your book, you have some thoughts of what we could do better in the plea bargaining realm. And you know, some of it has some hints to things that Dwayne was talking about, the kind of a neutral arbitrator type of role um, that could be served. Um, and then you also suggest helping prosecutors with more information as they're making their decisions. So maybe having an expert advisory body that could help them decide should a case be diverted or not, you know, ways to improve their decision making. So I guess I'd just like to hear you elaborate on those ideas and if based on what you've heard from other panelists, if it changes your perspective or enhances your view that these would be good or if you think there's ways in which they would be limited. Sure, sure. And actually, you've, uh, you must have read both of the books. That's amazing. I didn't know anybody bought them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think you, you, you can get it on Kindle now, I think. Uh, for, <laughs> it's good for traveling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so uh, 
Bill Kelly, a uh, professor at UT, uh, has done a lot of background work in this. And so the environment we were looking at, and, and we've been great friends forever. And so uh, being the US attorney um, in what is most years the, most, uh, the busiest uh, district in uh, the federal system, um, it just occurred to us in looking sort of in the environment uh, of, of plea negotiations and plea bargaining um, that I was very aware, um, being the sort of chief federal prosecutor, um, processing literally thousands and thousands of cases a year, the vast majority of them were being uh, resolved, as we've talked about, by means of a plea agreement. And that was a very, it was really an invisible system. It was uh, completely, uh, it, there was nothing transparent about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought, you know, it's, you know, someday we might be in a situation where we don't have great confidence in those who have these posi positions. And so what will we do then? How, how do we look behind the, the, the curtain? And, and uh, so we've kind of spent some time thinking about, uh, the first book was, you know, if, if we could reimagine this whole thing. And it was really a utopian sort of exercise. Um, and that's what uh, the professor was talking about, where we just kind of imagined uh, this, this system that we completely reworked in. And it was completely um, sort of, uh, again, utopian and, and, and unre unworkable. Um, but it, it, it just from a career prosecutor and a criminologist saying, what would we do if we knew everything we know now and we didn't have the political constraints? And we, it, what would we do? And that's where we came up with the idea of, you know, why don't we, it's all amount of funneling, right? The, the criminal justice system is an exercise in funneling. And it's what I uh, talked about before and, and what Professor Crespo said earlier, and that is we have a, a well-willed uh, prosecution and conviction machine is what we've, we've created. Um, but that doesn't, that, that has not been successful in, and we, we define the problem, the, uh, the problem as being recidivism, right? If you, how do you measure your success? We're the only, uh, really industry, if you can call it that, where no one really measures our success and we don't even know what the measure is. And so we, we just conceived this idea that how about a, a, a legitimate measure would be recidivism, right? They don't do it again. You, you can, you can argue about whether or not it's just incapac incapacitation or, or retributivist motivations and all, and there's a, a big strain of that in our culture, but, but we said, what, what works? Uh, what keeps people from doing this again? Um, and what we're doing doesn't work by any measure. And so what would we do? We would try to do a little better in identifying what the problems were, the criminogenic what why are people here? And in cases where uh, we know that in incarceration isn't gonna improve things for them or for anyone else, then we, we conceived of this idea of having people who do know things about that, mental health professionals, um, addiction experts, um, and, and putting resources, as I said before, into those things, uh, and, and building on the experience of drug courts and diversion courts, um, that it, where, where we're starting to get some generalizable data about what works and what doesn't work. The second piece of it is, though, was we, we wanted to attack this idea of uh, what do you do about this invisible system of, of everything being uh, resolved by means of, of plea, plea agreements where the public has no real um, uh, idea of what's going on. And, you know, you talk in the civil, on the civil side about the, the demise, There's this, everybody laments the, the demise of the civil trial, jury trial. And I think the same is true on the criminal side. I mean, there is great utility to having uh, some subset of, of uh, the community uh, on a regular basis saying, here's what's important to us. And they can do it a lot of ways. I mean, you have juries all the time that, that um, engage in uh, the opportunity to say, no, we're, that, that, we don't want to do that. And, we, and I think when prosecutors don't have uh, that kind of experience in having to put things in front of a jury routinely to see what the market is for certain things, then we all lose for that. So what do we do um, with this then? Uh, we said, okay, in the civil system, uh, what they've done, it, it, as a federal district judge, most cases, uh, civil cases, also settle out of court. And most of those do it by, with the assistance of some kind of uh, uh, alternative dispute resolution, uh, a mediator. Um, and so we kind of imagined on the back of a napkin uh, all of these things that we've been talking about all day, and that is we have this uh, sort of a set of assumptions about the plea negotiation world, and those assumptions are that we have great faith in the adversarial system, that we've got prosecutors who are uh, acting in good faith, not overreaching, um, all of these things, which usually is true. Um, we have defense lawyers who are competent and diligent um, and not overworked. 
I don't know whether that's usually true or not, um, but we have this set of assumptions, and I think we have reason now to question all of those assumptions, and we said, well, what's the, what's the fix there? Oh, and also the thing that we've talked about all day is the context of these negotiations. And what the public, I think, doesn't really recognize is that most of these, in my experience as a career prosecutor, most of these uh, negotiations take place in a hallway outside of a courtroom um, or on a quick phone call. And they happen sometimes in cir circumstances where we've all talked about before in where there's incomplete information, but because, again, in the federal system, there's a premium on coming in early. And if you are, if, if you've got a 32 uh, defendant case, uh, we only need the first four or five of you. Um, and so there is a, a premium in getting in. So there are all kind of institutional uh, uh, sort of um, things going on that we ought to be worried about. The answer to the question then is, we came up with this idea, and again, it's, it's, it's a bit utopian because it would require resources, but we thought, you know what, why, why don't we imagine uh, this role called a, a, media, a plea mediator? Where is that? And it's may, maybe not unlike something like the judges in these justice courts. See, the problem with getting judges involved, setting aside the ethical concerns, which I think are significant procedurally, we can't do it as federal judges. Um, but also, if, if the assumption is we're doing all of this because we, we've got to dispose of these cases by means of pleas because we would be overwhelmed. Well, getting judges involved in plea negotiation effectively doubles the number of judges touching a case, and that doesn't solve our problem. Um, we have, uh, you know, in Philadelphia, uh, Judge Beavis, I'm so glad you're here because anytime there's a circuit judge here, I get to talk about how hard district judges work. Um, <laughs> we have, we uh, in, in Philadelphia, there are 19 sitting federal judges, 12 active uh, senior judges who are taking cases. Austin is about half the size of Philadelphia. We have two district judges and one senior judge who doesn't take any new cases. We can't be involved in plea negotiation, even if we wanted to and the rules let us. We've got to have somebody, and so we looked at this role called a, a plea mediator that would effectively be this third party to sit there and look at, be, be the representative of the conscience of the community and of the court and to look at these negotiations and say, okay, this is a little outside the mainstream, this offer or this, uh, this prosecutor, you know, over time uh, tends to, to kind of maybe overreach. Uh, this defense lawyer isn't looking closely at the file. We've talked about that sort of thing. So having somebody who's experienced and knowledgeable look at these things and engage in uh, both parties in saying, you know what, are you each doing your job in ways that we all should feel comfortable about it? And, uh, and so we've, we did this little uh, exper thought experiment about what that would look like. And, and it's one of many ideas, but something that we thought might at least generate conversation. So I'm wondering, um in light of what you said about the resource constraints, which I think is a big part of what we've heard all day. You know, some of these solutions require more resources. It doesn't seem like there's more resources to give. Um, and I'm wondering if we can put some of the appellate judges to work by, um, how much of a difference do you think it would make if we got rid of waivers and plea agreements to file appeals? Because, you know, another thing that happens in these negotiations is it's very common, um, particularly in the federal system, but in state systems as well, for the agreement to state you waive your right to raise any constitutional arguments, other arguments, and you know, one of the things we heard from earlier panels today is, you know, that stunts the growth of the law, and it also makes it so that we don't see as many of the errors in the system. Um, how much would that help um, if some of the issues then were dealt with by appellate courts, who then would, you know, the decisions then would have an influence on what takes place below? I don't know if you have thoughts, Judge Pippen. I think it would help, and I think it's just a, yet another thing that, that we, we should talk occasionally about fairness too. I mean, it, it used to be the case that we would require people to waive uh, the uh, right to appeal in effect, claims of ineffective assistance of counsel. I mean, wrap your head around that. Yeah. Um, but we did it, and we did it over and over again. And I think now we need to step back and say. Why are we, I mean, we've got resources in the U.S. Attorney's Office. To, we've got an appellate section. And those are places, to your point, where we, we actually need, need to litigate some of these things. And we need the guidance of our uh, wiser bosses to say, you know, um, give them an opportunity to take these things up and come back down. So to your point, absolutely. I, I, I'm not a big fan of waivers at all. No, oh, me neither. That's why I asked the question. So I, I <laughs> it's full disclosure. That's the one privilege that you get as the moderator. Um, so I know I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience too. Um, but I guess the one last question that I want to think about for all of you, and any of you can interject, and John, I know you've thought about this in the context of some judges do do more within their own courtrooms in ways that don't necessarily increase their workload. I mean, I guess it might. So I'm thinking of standing orders 
orders where the judge insists that discovery be turned over like um, Judge Emmett Sullivan and the DC District Court has these other judges do that. So it's a way, if you don't have a new state law that's mandating disclosure, judges could insist in their courtroom that certain things be turned over. Um, and then I'm thinking of examples, again, might not increase workload, but, um, and Dwayne, you mentioned something like this, like the offer comes in or you say, you know, maybe go back to your supervisor and just make sure that's okay. The kind of more subtle pressure that's not necessarily making the judge work any harder, but is at least indicating when an offer is just goes too far, maybe rethink that one, come back again. Maybe they'll come back and they'll do the same thing, but the signaling effect that the judge gives. I'm just curious to get any of your reactions on how effective those kinds of techniques by judges are and whether they're realistic or in fact they do create just, they're, they're, the dockets are just so oppressive that it's hard for judges to interject. So I think it is very realistic. Um, it was mentioned earlier today that New York State in 2018 adopted a rule that requires every judge at the first appearance in every criminal case to issue a Brady order. The idea here was to educate lawyers on both sides and judges about what is Brady. And the second reason behind this is to give prosecutors an incentive because if they willfully violate it, then they're willfully violating a court order and subjecting themselves to criminal contempt. So Judge Sullivan and um, the Ted Stevens case um, issues such orders. Well, there's a lot of academics in this audience who talk about court-ordered proposals. This is a pretty interesting one to study because it's very rare that you have a whole state adopting a new rule that applies in every single case. Every judge must issue this at the first appearance. So there's a lot of potential here for both education and providing an incentive for prosecutors. Judges, the, the problem with its rollout in the first year is there's not, hasn't been buy-in by judges. It's like most of them, we did a survey of 100 and, 160 people responded. Four-fifths of them said this is, thing has had no effect at all. One-fifth have said it has a little effect. Nobody said it had more than a little effect. Well, what's the problem? Part of the problem is the way the order is written. It, on, on the timing of disclosures, Brady Law on timing is much worse than many people believe, but it talks about five different standards, meet the federal, meet the state constitution, meet the statute. If it's exculpatory, do it as soon as you can. But then there's this sentence, any Brady disclosure 30 days before trial is presumptively timely. Well, hardly any cases get to 30 days before trial. So the drafting of this order is the first big problem, why it's had little effect. The second is judges just haven't bought into it in a way where they, I mean, the main problem with Brady is how does the prosecutor get the information, the police files? So one of the things in this order was it requires prosecutor to obtain a complete copy of the police file, because that's where most of the Brady violations are that the Innocence Project and others finds wrongful convictions. It's like, it's, it, it, do the police give the prosecutor everything? So this order requires prosecutors to confer with all officers acting in the case and to review the file. So we go to judges and say, judge, ask the prosecutor if they've done that yet. And the standard response for almost in, in the survey was, judges just say, prosecutor, I remind you of your Brady obligations. And they have refused to actually actively play a role in enforcing it. You can ask about why, but I think they have the time to do it. Because in New York, judges do play a role in plea bargaining. They do routine, like if you're taking a plea to the top charge, which actually happens fairly often because if someone has a criminal record, they're not getting a new criminal record, then the judge can just cut the prosecutor out of the whole process and negotiate the sentence with the defense lawyer. So judges do spend a lot of time. They seem to have time for plea negotiations. They haven't taken ownership of this order, and we should think about why judges aren't taking ownership and we should change the order. Because really, like, the judge can play a very significant role in questioning the prosecutor and the defense about discovery compliance, efforts to get the information from the police, and um, I don't know why judges um, haven't really adopted this as their own order since they are signing it. Each judge signs the order. But that's the next step for making this meaningful. It sounds like, too, from what we heard from early panelists, that's a big issue. If we're looking to judges to be the saviors on this one, that <laughs> they're, they're not exactly showing ownership on a variety of issues that would help, you know, including this question of diversion, because judges could do more. Um, judges could ask for consultations or expertise on questions of diversion. And we do know judges have put some pressure in certain places to create alternative courts and diversion courts. Um, and so it is a real question of how you get them more interested in these issues. 
I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. I just want to say the one yep. thing that I, I, I didn't mention and why I think it's important to have judges involved and why I think it's effective in Connecticut is, you know, frequently if everything is being played out, the judges actually have no real sense of who the people are who appear before them. You only get them in the context of the allegations and you only get them in the context of the crime. And that's the same for the prosecutor. But every time I had an opportunity, and this is a perfect situation for me, I might have had 20 cases, but every time I had a client, I had an opportunity to meet with them enough times that I knew who they were. I had an opportunity to put together some mitigating evidence, and I had an opportunity to present who they were to the judge and to the prosecutor. And so I think that that just sort of changed the dynamic. And the other piece that I would say is, there, there are a lot of alternatives to incarceration in Connecticut. Maybe there aren't as many as there should be, but what will happen is you might get a situation where the judge would say, I think this is a good candidate for X program. And the prosecutor might be reluctant at first, but then the prosecutor might say, yeah, I think that this is a good candidate for X program. And so I think the other role that the judges play is to create an opportunity to have somebody be heard in a way in which they generally don't get heard if all you do is stand in front of court and, um, and, and have, you know, you plead guilty or not guilty, and then your defense attorneys talk to the prosecutor in the hallway, and the conversation is solely about the disposition. It's not really about all of these other factors mm -hmm. that frequently play a role when you say, this person committed X conduct, but they do not belong in prison. They maybe don't even deserve to have a criminal record. What should happen given those facts? And I think you raise a good point. If we had time, we'd have more panels, including one on defense attorneys and what they can do to better situate their clients and their arguments. But you are suggesting that giving time to get to know them, taking some of the resource constraints off them and giving them more information would certainly help. Um, so I want to make sure you all have a chance to ask questions if you like. So I don't know if we have questions in the audience. And we'll get a microphone headed your way back there. I see Esther. As the microphone goes back there, can I just add one yes. thing? So, so Duane alluded to this. This happened at an earlier panel, too. People said the, the person in the courtroom who knows the least about the case is the judge. And, and we seem to accept that. And I guess I'm just a little, I'm a little worried about the fact that we accept that so quickly, right? This isn't a civil settlement where, where money is changing hands between a civil defendant and a plaintiff. This is the system giving a criminal conviction to someone. And the idea that the judge can act as a rubber stamp strikes me as deeply, deeply, deeply problematic. The judge has to take the plea colloquy and enter the judgment of conviction. The judge is responsible for that. Um, and I, I, find it, um, I find it distressing that, that it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to play out that way. That the thought is this is between the parties, even though it's really the judge who's entering the order. One of the questions I had was um, how the criminal system in the United States is mostly a state system. And within the state system, there's just so much local culture um, that governs how offices are run. Uh, so, you know, assuming that these uh, reforms we talked about are not constitutionally required, um, they're just good ideas, how do you butt against the, just the local control and the pride that prosecutors and judges take in their own system and not wanting to change and adopt other systems? <laughs> Anyone? Well, we were searching uh, a while ago for explanations oh. <laughs> about what drove the New York sort of changes and everything. And one thing that wasn't said that I think we need to acknowledge is uh, we have believed for a long time with some reason uh, that, uh, and, and this is speaking for, for someone who's never run for office and never will, um, but if you look at elected DAs and elected judges, which we have where I'm from in Texas, um, there has been a very uh, strong belief that tough on crime sells. Yeah. Um, and I think there's reason to believe that that's true, but maybe what we're seeing now is that there's a realization uh, among the public that um, for, for, for a variety of reasons, maybe conf different reasons from different constituencies, uh, that we don't quite buy that anymore. And maybe, maybe we're seeing a corner turn. I don't know. And, and then the only thing I'll add is like one fascinating thing happened in Connecticut. And so I didn't know what the Criminal Justice Commission was, but the Criminal Justice Commission is the body that, that appoints the, um, the state's attorney for each geographical area in Connecticut. And, um, and the governor appoints the chief state's attorney. And so for all of these years, even when the governor was about criminal justice reform, the, the members of the Criminal Justice Commission never really changed to reflect that type of intention. And, um, and the ACLU spent a lot of effort and energy to try to get somebody, to get Governor Lamont 
to agree to try to um, compose a criminal justice commission that was more reflective of the sort of anti-excessive incarceration ideals of his campaign. And, um, and they asked me if I, would, if I would like accept the nomination, which for me was kind of absurd because like I said, I had pled guilty to a crime. I had spent time in prison. And now I was asked to be a part of a body of people who were going to pick the person that would be the prosecutor in these different places in Connecticut. But, but what I found really interesting, and one of the reasons why I said yes, is because when I was trying to do research in some places in Connecticut and find out what was going on in the prosecutor's office, the prosecutors would sort of routinely say, um, first, you got to talk to the state's attorney. And then the state's attorney would say, like, we don't allow researchers here. And I don't know if they, didn't, they just didn't like me or they just didn't like transparency. But I think the only way to kind of encourage transparency is to think about um, the different roles that we play in the system, especially in places where the, the, the state's attorney is not elected. I don't know if there's any other questions from the audience. Uh, I'll follow up on Esther's question. It seems to me that there's almost a presumption or assumption that if judges get more active in the plea bargaining process, which I personally favor, but using her regional stamp of different legal cultures and different, and the fact that most judges under trial ever are elected. I think it's way utopian to presume that that's necessarily going to be in favor of the defendants because the election uh, demon behind their heads, I think may very well make them uh, more, in favor of a higher sentence because of the less, the, the subliminal stamp of knowing what's going to come next in the front page of a tabloid. I mean, yeah, in New York where judges do play a role in either pressuring the prosecutor or negotiating directly, it just depends on the judge. It's not a benefit across the board. A lot of judges make the prosecutor go higher than they otherwise would have or reject plea deals. So I don't view that as a as a total benefit, but in many cases, the, the judge does get the prosecutor to reduce the sentence. And what I was talking about mostly also is, is discovery and Brady exculpatory evidence. I mean, there's, there, I can't really see much of a, a downside in having the, pro the judge take ownership of Brady and play a role monitoring that there's been compliance and what the efforts were. And I think that does go to Carissa's point that if you're gonna sign off on that, on that plea, the fact that you don't have that kind of enforcement of Brady is definitely disconcerting because you would want both sides to have as much information as possible. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more if there's any others from the audience. Candace McCoy, City University of New York. Um, following up on judges taking power, uh, taking the initiative, if the discovery is better and if the facts are known more, um, there, there's uh, discussion in the literature about increasing the potential for bench trials. What do you think of that? Judge, do you want to be the one to answer that, or no. is anybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's not—it's not going to happen in New York City, where Still where I time. practice. But yeah. yeah. I mean, I would not uh, be opposed to that. I think the problem is you have such a variety among judges that I think that um, uh, it it would you don't want a situation where it would and I know you're all gonna say, but that's the world we live in, it would depend on which judge you drew. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that that, that would be the case, because thinking of within my own uh, jurisdiction, there are, I guess, 16 of us, and um, you know, we would be all over the map, and I'm not, I don't know if that would be a disincentive to, if in a blind system when you don't, where you don't know what judge you're gonna get. Now in Austin, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I've done, believe it or not, I've, I have done, uh, as a prosecutor, some bench trials in federal court, and uh, those were, I, I don't see the utility in the context of what we're talking about now um, because of the, uh, the, it would depend so greatly on the sensitivities of the particular judge you're in front of, and I'm not sure that that would be necessarily helpful. All right, so and, and we'll, can I just say one yes. more thing too? I just want to make sure I'm clear too. I mean, I'm arguing uh, or discussing this, or even like thinking about this 
from the perspective of like absolute guilt. I feel like so many of the conversations that we have about the criminal justice system, uh, about like over incarceration as a product of some kind of gross injustice. And I'm really thinking about what kind of system would have best served the people that I know who are still incarcerated, who've been incarcerated for 10 or 15 or 20 years, or the system that would have actually served me. And I recognize that like a lot of the discussions around plea bargaining don't exist in a context that would have ever served me. Like I confessed six and a half minutes to the, to the second after being incarcerated. You know, they locked me up and I was like, listen, I did it. I don't really know what I was thinking about, but I did it. And from that point on, it was never a question of would I go to trial and what would happen when I went to trial. And so I think sometimes if we have conversations about this, because somebody might hear this and say that I'm absolutely pro-prosecutor and pro-judge, but part of it is I'm trying to imagine what kind of a system might exist that would serve people who are absolutely guilty and by the standard letter of the law because they live in a state like New York where you could face five to 25, or you know I literally faced three to life in 21 years. Like I want a system that imagines a person like that not being warranted um, a sentence of 30 or 40 years in prison. And I can't get to that system without imagining how to get other actors involved that would think about things beyond sort of the absurd mandatory sentences and absurd discretionary sentences that are possible across a spectrum of crimes that are violent but, but might not be what we think about when we say this person deserves 50 years in prison or this person deserves 40 years in prison. So that brings us full circle to where we started and the need for legislative changes to get at some of those long sentences, the mandatory minimum, some of the initial things you threw out. Um, I'm gonna keep us on time so we have <laughs> the ability to listen to Dwayne discuss with uh, Emily Basil on her book, Charge, which is coming up in 15 minutes. So make sure you get back here for the keynote and please join me in thanking these great panelists.